It's from... It's Tony. No, it's Tony. It's Tony. It's Tony. Oh, okay. It's Tony. There's Tony. Okay. <laughs> well, let's bless the name of the Lord together. Hallelujah. We praise your name. We lift up your name on high. And Lord, yes, we want to shout it from the mountaintops. And we want to say it in the depths of the valley also. That all men may hear. You are God. You are God of yes. Israel. Mm -hmm. You yes. are the one true and living God. You are the only way, truth, and life. It is you, Yeshua Jesus, that allows us to come to Jehovah God through your shed blood, and the two of you are one. The great, mm -hmm. amazing, ineffable, indescribable mm -hmm. yes. Elohim Haim, Most High God. Here are praises. Lord, we give it you this time, and we ask you, to inhabit the praises of those here who love you, whether it is in their living room or in our live room. We thank you. We're knit together in the Ruach HaKodesh, and to you be all glory. Hallelujah. In Yeshua Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Now, we'll go with our Shema, the most revered uh, prayer from the scripture. Sorry, I've got a neighbor mowing the lawn. Obviously, they're not observing Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll try to keep the noise out. Roger, let's get our schma up and going. If you like tradition, face east. That's on my right in my house. And uh, if you don't, God's not looking for formality. He's looking for the hearts. And put it loud enough, it drowns out the long more Roger. <laughs> Huh? Drown out the lawnmower. Yeah. <laughs> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments, commanded us to be a light to the nations, and who has given us Yeshua Jesus, our Messiah, the light of the world. Amen and hallelujah. And we don't need the light to have the light, but we love that we bring in the light to show to those who are out there, the light has come, the darkness must flee. Hallelujah, we have a, a Savior who is more powerful than the enemy. And as we spoke about before we came on, even through the airwaves, our God is in control. 
Our God is an amazing God. He is an awesome God. He is ineffable. He is indescribable. I could go on and on, but today, because we're in our third out of seven Shabbats of comfort, I want us just to remember that name, Nahum in our Hebrew, comfort. He is the God of all comfort. You may be coming from a place that is not comfortable right now. You may be coming with a need, with a concern on your heart. Know that he is there to comfort. He is there to help you and to bring you through. All you need to do is plug into Yeshua and you have all the answers. The light of the world knows no power failure. So as we go into a time of praise and worship, worship him. He is our eternal God. He is alive. He is a loving God. He is the God who comforts. He is the great shepherd. And the great shepherd even lays down his life for the sheep. In our case, hallelujah, he did that. But it was not the end. It was the end of the beginning because he rose from the dead to give us the abundant life that we see in and through him. And one day we'll see face to face. Are you ready to praise him? How can you not? If you know the God of your salvation, you're ready. So I encourage you in the privacy of your home, in the midst of the group, make a joyful noise, shout, dance, sing, whatever your heart wants to express. We're going to start with Baruch Adonai, the melody of blessed be the name of our Lord God. He is king of glory, and in him, with that comfort, we find our resting place. Be blessed. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. <coughs> Who's listening? There we go. Okay, very good. Thank you, Lord. If you can stop with Brooke out and I, then we flow into King of Glory. Uh oh. Okay. Yeah. And and I agree. Last night, Lita, our music we started off praising and wow, it yeah. it was electrifying in the room. Yes. And, uh, if you can't get it, we'll go with a different order. Okay. If you can, I do say
Yeah, I've got a green light. I hope you're as blessed as I am. Yes. <laughs> to know that the God of the universe yes. comes and fills this place today. Amen. Fills our hearts. Mm. Meets us. Comforts us. The God of all comfort. What an amazing God. How big is your God? Yes. How big is God? How big is God? And that's, that's perfect for t today's uh message and, and I'm realizing I want to start with a word of prayer left before also our uh, Pastor Gill there we go now I can hear Pastor Gill and Francis are at a family reunion um, wanting to be a light there Loretta is with a family reunion wanting to be a light she even called her family reunion together she was the instigator with one intent I want to know that all my family knows who God is and that they can know him personally. So as we go into a time of prayer for the opening of the word of God, let's uh, hold them up in prayer that the testimony goes forth. Ah, God of all comfort, Nachum, El, El Nachum, our God of all comfort, we, we do, humbly, and yet inside jumping up and down with praise and adoration and glory for who you are. Thank you that you do fill this place with your presence, that you are King of glory. You've come through the gates, you've burst them open, and you have filled this place with your presence. Lord, how thankful and privileged we are to know you on this personal level, to enter into your rest and truly know that resting place even in the midst of the storm. Lord, we thank you that you are with Pastor Gill, that you're with Francis, that you're with Loretta, in a very special way today as they want to share with their family, their loved ones, yes. who you are and what you mean to them in their lives. We ask for an anointing upon them, an opportunity for the words to go forth that will not be just words, will not be just something that dies in the wind, that, Lord, your word is lasting, it is living, and it is everlasting. Yes. And we pray that any heart that needs to know that will hear. We'll ask them questions. We'll give them opportunity to share that they too yes. might have the joy of knowing the one who can bring them all comfort no matter what life hands them. Lord, we thank you for each and every one knitted together here by the Ruch HaKodesh. And we ask for that anointing, that oil that is being poured out as we sing about, Lord on your holy word. As we open it, may it revive us, may it be lifted off the pages into the, the reality of what it is, the living word. That this is the word, the word is our God, yes. and the word has gone forth, and nothing is ever the same again. By your words, this earth was created. By your words, it is sustained in space. By your words, we were created. And by your words, we are sustained. Praise you. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Dip us, Lord, in the well of our salvation and fill us with the living words of our living and holy God. To you be praise. Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God Almighty. Oh, amen. 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 You know, the world will give you a natural, I'm sorry, an unnatural high. They'll to give you a, a pill or this or that to tell you that, oh, this will lift you up and your circumstances will be different. And momentarily, it can. It may be a good trip and it may be a horrible trip, but I guarantee you, no matter which way, you crash when it's over. It's not lasting, it's not true, and it's not worth whatever it puts you through emotionally. But if I ever want a spiritual high, all I have to do is just start listening, focusing, hearing the names of my God. If you truly start putting your mind on Him, I guarantee you, you're lifted up. In this time, this parsha and this Shabbat of comfort, we're moving rapidly toward our high holy days. But in this time, God has said, take these seven and be 
comforted. How are we comforted? We're comforted by his very words. So as we go into this, I pray and I encourage you to pray in your heart even now that you will hear from the throne. You will not hear a voice in this room that's human, that's fleshly and corruptive. Corrupt, corrupt, it, I'm not perfect. <laughs> but that you'll hear the voice of your God, yes. your Abba speaking to you and may it lift you up comfort you bring you his shalom and send you out all the more on fire to tell everyone i've got the best and i get to share it with you i can give it and yet there's more that comes because it is like the spring of water springing up filling us up and as it's poured out, more and more and more comes. We can never empty ourselves of the love of our God, but yet we can freely share. Hallelujah. What a joy to have the opportunity to share this with you. And as I draw your attention into our parasha for this week, it's, it, it's C. And when it starts out, and I should have written down, it's Deuteronomy 11. I think it, toward the end of the chapter, maybe it starts in 12, but I think it's toward the end of 11. It starts out and it talks about see. See with your eyes. See. You need to be seeing. And the way it is being said is you see. Singular. Nora sees. Roger is to see. Rudy is to see. It's singular there, but you see before you. And that you is a plural you. So that's all of us. So we each individually see, but then we see as a group. And when I take this into what is being taught to our Hebrew people, because origination of the scriptures were given to Israel. And even though we can take and apply, we do not rob from Israel because God has a plan for Israel that he's carrying out this very day. He hasn't abandoned her. He hasn't neglected her. He hasn't forsaken her. And he has not forgotten his chosen people. But he's also brought in another people that are called his treasure, that are called his royal priesthood, that get the privilege of calling him Abba also, Father. And in this, our Jewish people are taught we are to believe that it is as if we were there when this was happening. So, in, in, for instance, if we're talking about Moshe receiving the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. I as a Jewish person am to believe I was right there. I was hearing it, Shema. I was seeing, Re'ah. I am personally involved. And then it's not left to me as an individual because then it moves to the group. So what I see is for all. We're all part of that. And in that, in this parsha, they're being told about a mutual responsibility. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer in this case would be yes, yes. you are. You are responsible to share it, to help your brethren, to look for where they need help. To, yes, correct one, gently and in love. Not that we're here to be the judge, that when we see a brother in need, it is our responsibility. Reach out, help, bring them in. Because God has promised if we stay under his authority and be obedient to him, the blessings flow. Oh, the blessings. He gave so many blessings. And Israel will know all of those blessings in their entirety, fully and completely, when Yeshua is sitting on the throne in Israel in that millennial reign of a thousand years of shalom. Can you imagine shalom? Shalom worldwide. Not just in a home, not just in the temple, not just in a city, but through the nation, to the nations, to the entire ends of the earth. And this whole earth is crying out for that even now. And we cry out, do we not? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, Adonai, Yeshua. As they go through this, this, uh, these scriptures, and they're realizing their responsibility, 
This is so fundamental to Judaism. This is the Jewish way of thought. They are taught to thought, to think personally responsible, but to think and realize they're part of a community. And in that, I see the Lord wanting them to strengthen each other because swirling all around them was idolatry. Every other nation had their gods. And I say that in plurality. Israel had one God, the one true and living God. That's what separates him from all the other gods. I do not care what name you give to any other God. There's one thing they all have in common. They are dead. They are not alive. Israel, you have the living God. You have the God who can enable you to be obedient. And as you stay obedient, the blessings flow. Mm -hmm. Now, he did warn them there were curses, there were consequences that would also flow for disobedience. And even though they were warned and clearly warned, sadly, we know our history of our people is an up and a down. It's like riding that roller coaster. It's twists and turns and ups and downs. But every time our people stayed focused on the Lord and stayed obedient, the blessings were there. Every time they took their eyes off of God, forgot their God, looked to other dead gods, or even just forsook all and put themselves on that throne position, what followed? Consequences. To the point that when we come into our Hoftor portion, we're talking about the, the portion of scripture after our first five books, where we go into what the prophets had to say. And even in this time, when we're reading the words of comfort from our prophets, and especially Yeshua, especially Isaiah, even at this time, what is Isaiah facing? Is the nation being blessed? Is the nation in a good place spiritually? And I have to say, sadly, no. They are so disobedient. They have been so <clears throat> afar from their God that he's having to allow them even to be taken out of their land of promise. <clears throat> Isaiah is telling them, you're going to go into captivity. Now, you've got to say, Rochelle, that's not comforting words. <laughs> but in the midst of that, God was letting them know, I am your everlasting covenant-keeping God. You will come back. There will be restoration. Your promises will be fulfilled. It's not his desire to send them to the woodshed. But we all know, as a good parent, you cannot allow disobedience to go unchecked. So even in this time, when we look to this, a period of time when sadly our people are so far from God that they are going to suffer great and heavy consequences and it's going to carry on. It's not going to be over in a day. Yet every Shabbat of comfort, every one of the seven, we bring out, because it's in our scriptures, that there is a restoration. Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, desolate now. At this time, with Isaiah going into being desolate, we know there was the, the captivity later in 70 AD, again, at, at the disobedience that destroyed the second temple, that found Jerusalem in complete ruins, that found Jewish people scattered to even just try to survive. And yet, at a time like that, you know how Jerusalem is described? It's described as having a foundation. This foundation is sapphires and diamonds and jewels. And if you're learned in your scriptures, your mind is gone, aha, I know what's being spoken about. You're told, incline your ear. Are you hearing the voice of God? Even in the midst of correction, even in the midst of circumstances beyond your control, even when you cannot see the evidence of that shalom that we're speaking of that's coming, are you inclining your ear? Because God will speak shalom and peace and comfort and remind you, even in the midst of your storm, He is the covenant-keeping God. He is faithful. He is everlasting. And the fulfillment of those covenant promises will come to Israel as a nation. There's one thing she has to do, and it's only one. And when she does it, this will come. 
And that is when she finally accepts her Messiah. When she finally cries out, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That is when, in his return, in glory, the promises will be seen fulfilled. In the Parsha, I'm sorry, yep, well it's in our Parsha, in the Haftor portion this week, we're in chapter 55. I'm going to take you back to 40. So we're going to study from chapter 40. We will not get through it in its entirety. If you're out there and you're going to be seeing it in the archives, we'll put up part one. Part two may or may not be next week, but we will continue. We'll put it all together as a series when it is finished, depending on, on how long it takes. It may be a couple times. It may be three times. But I, I just want you to know it will. We will come back to it. Because remember, we have seven Shabbats of comfort. So we will come back because chapter 40 is so key. It starts out, comfort ye, comfort ye. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But this week, they've read 40 last week. And now they're in chapter 55. They've not read everything in between. They read certain portions. But chapter 55 and verse 1 says, All you who are thirsty... Come to the water. You without money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money. It's free. How do you buy when it's free? What we're being told is we buy freely. You don't have to have money. You don't have to have credits to your name. You don't have to have earned. You don't have to find something to give in exchange. You just come and you buy freely. And that water flows freely. If you've ever been thirsty, and I think that's common to man, if you've ever been thirsty, nothing satisfies like what God created. His water, the satisfying to the flesh, and yet what he's speaking of here is a water that is so different. It is not of the natural, it is of the supernatural. And if I started with the beginning of our Haftorah and started with verse 11 in chapter 54, it starts out, of Isaiah, it starts out, O oh, afflicted and storm-tossed. It's talking about stormy waters, troubled waters. As soon as I say those words, afflicted and storm-tossed, can you not see in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, a little tiny boat, and the waters are going, and if anything, they're not stopping to drink. At this point, they're bailing water out as quickly as they can, and they're feeling anything but comfort. And yet it's in the middle of those words that they're being told, if you're thirsty, come, come to the water. That's such a contrast. Why in the midst of a storm, would the focus be on come and get a drink of water? Because again, it's not the surrounding waters. It's not the troubled waters. It's not the storm-tossed sea. This is a different water. And when we hear it in that sense of to come by it freely, it takes us to the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, chapter 22. Revelation 22, almost the very last words of our scripture. And here are the similarities I read for you in verse 17. The spirit that we know is the Ruch HaKodesh, the bride, that's us with our bridegroom, saying, come, let anyone who hears, remember, Shema, we're to be hearing, let anyone who hears say, come, and let anyone who is thirsty, come, let anyone who wishes take the water of life free of charge. Do these sound like the same words? Do you see why I constantly tell you? We have one book. We have one story. It is a history of Yeshua HaMashiach in relation to his people. He is the one who is saying, come. Come to receive the water from him. And in our Jewish history, we know that there is a water libation ceremony. Not today, because they do not have the temple, but every year with the temple. This took place at the time of Sukkot, on the last day of Sukkot. I will not go into detail now, but when Sukkot, Sukkot comes, we'll talk about it. But in great brevity, this is a celebration that they say, if you have not participated in this celebration, you don't know what joy is. For seven days, they've been bringing up water from the Pool of Siloam 
to the temple. They've been bringing it up out of a golden pitcher, pouring it into a silver basin, all this symbolic, all of this meaning. If you don't know, we'll, we'll touch on it in detail later, but there's ways you can find out ahead. Just let me know and I'll connect you so you can know. But overall, let me just say it is a picture of Yeshua and his work for us. And they bring in this water on this last day. They're dancing and all the, the, the minstrels that they're singing and all the, the harps and every instrument they have. And the people are coming in procession and they're coming around the throne and they're singing their praises to God. And there's a couple of key things that they are singing. One, again, is out of our prophet Isaiah, and it's chapter 12 and verse 3. And it says, Therefore, with joy, we will draw water where are they going to draw water? Why are they so joyful? Because it comes out of the wells of salvation. This gives us a hint that again we're talking about spiritual water because there is no physical well of salvation. I've been to Yaakov's well. I've drunk from the well of my ancestor. It's pure and it's wonderful. But you know what happened? I got thirsty again. I've had to drink water many a time since and I can't go back to that well and get it. But this is a water that you never thirst again. This is a water that satiates. This is a water that is free for anyone. And you don't have to go to Israel to get it. This is the water that Yeshua, in the midst of this ceremony, with all that was going on, the menorahs, a 75-foot menorahs, they're lit. It is just such a, a wow to see and to hear. And we're told in Yochanan John chapter 7 that Yeshua was celebrating this with his people. And this is where he stood up. And it says he cried out with a loud voice. He wasn't crying out because he was angry. He wasn't crying out with tears in, in the sense that we think crying. But it was with a loud voice. Why? You ever been in a celebration? I'm going to a three-year-old birthday party this afternoon. Should I take my earplugs? Yeah. <laughs> Quite possibly so. <laughs> Celebrating is loud and it's noisy, and yet he wanted to be heard above the crowd. Because in the midst of this, that was such a picture of Messiah. He wanted them to see it in living color. And he said, any who are thirsty, right on target, come to me and I will give you waters, uh, living waters, and you will thirst no more. That's all of this that's being told. And here we are prophetically looking at it from Isaiah, seeing it fulfilled in Yeshua, and hearing the culmination and revelation when all of Israel will drink from the well of salvation. Wow, what a promise. How exciting. And yet, what about the in-between? Remember, we're singular responsible, but we are collectively part of that community to share and to point out and to tell and to bring to our people whatever comfort we can bring them in the midst of their storm. And I will tell you, we have everything we need to bring them because it's not us and it's not our comfort. It is the very word of the living God, the God of Israel, who will comfort their souls. And as each Shabbat, we remind our people right now that there is coming that restoration, that the Jewish people will be restored to their land. We know it has started. Israel's reborn in a day, the fulfillment of Isaiah 66, and yet we know there's a greater fulfillment. We know that we are still living in a time called the diaspora, and I'm living proof. I don't know if there's any other Jews in the room here, but if there are, you're in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. Where do we belong? In the land. In the land, in the land of promise, and there will be the day that the angels from the four corners will bring them back. People will put them on their shoulders, carry them back into the land. If you think this water libation ceremony was something, wait till you see the get in gathering to the throne of Messiah Yeshua. Whoa. And I guarantee you, it's not going to be quiet. <laughs> it's going to be joyful. And the whole earth will be filled with the joy of the Lord singing and praising the Lord. I can hardly wait. This earth has never known that kind of shalom that will come to them then. As we remind them of that, we remind them that this involves the future redemption of Israel. This isn't just putting people in a geographic location. This is redemption. This is the fulfillment of the covenant-keeping God who says, I have redeemed you 
with my righteous right hand. This is referring to the coming of the Messianic era when we see on earth God's words fulfilled completely. But this is the restoration that each Jewish person can know individually now. Each Gentile also can know individually now because we're in a time when the dear Gentiles are grafted into that same root and the two come to faith in the same way. There is no other way but through the God of Israel who brought the way through the one who said, I am. Oh, I am. We know that voice from the wilderness days. We know that voice from before Moshe was raised up. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Hallelujah. We can know that abundant life now. We can know the way to Jehovah. No question. No concern. No hope. No let me do enough. No. The way has been paved. It's been paved in blood. It cost Yeshua his human life. But in that, he laid down his life that he might pick it up again and give us abundant, everlasting life. Hallelujah. What a God. What a promise. And he tells our people, this is your future, but you can know comfort now in the midst of your storm in the midst of the destruction of the temple. And why is that huge? Because for our Jewish people, the temple was everything. Life centered around the temple. The temple told them everything they needed to know of how to live life, what to do, where they belong, where they go, what they're to do, even right down to as their crops are coming in, the first of it goes to the temple. It goes to God. He has blessed and given every Shabbat when we do our, our Kiddush. We are reminded it is God who brings out the sustenance of the earth, the fruit of the vine. We give the glory to him. And as we were even reminded last night in our group gathering together there, we don't bless our food. We bless our God who brings us our food. Mm -hmm. And as we come into that, as we realize no matter your circumstances, we can look to Israel's scriptures and we cannot steal them from her, but we can apply them to ourselves also. So as we look at chapter 40, as we start with verse 1, it starts out with those words, comfort you, comfort you, right from the very beginning. Let me tell you, chapter 39 of this book is talking about the destruction. It's talking about going off into captivity. That's depressing, that's discouraging, that should have put them on their knees in crying out to their God. That's where they're at. But in the midst of that, here comes chapter 40. Here comes the promise of that restoration. Here comes how our Jewish people are and will be comforted. Here comes the Yerushalayim going from destruction to foundation of, of precious stones. And despite those circumstances, despite the, the, what they're having to endure for a time, here is the Lord saying, he's going to be vindicated in his glory. Remember that temple that was so important? The temple was where the Shekhinah glory of God dwelt. The temple was the place where God met the people and the people met God. That's how it was done in that time. We have the privilege in our day and age of the Ruch HaKodesh in us so that we are the temple of our God. So we can be filled as we sing with the Spirit of God in this very place on this very day. But for our Jewish people at that time, it was going to the temple. It was seeing the tangible Shekhinah glory there. It was knowing that the Holy of Holies had a mercy seat. Why? Because they needed mercy. So this is of most importance to them. This is the way to their God. It was literally the way because it was the picture of the way. So I should say it wasn't literal. It was, it was figurative because the whole layout and everything spoke of the cross. It pointed to Yeshua. It told them. It taught them. The gate that opened all the way through was Yeshua. 
in each stage. And as they're remembering and seeing and knowing their comfort comes from the glory of God, from His presence with them. When you're in the presence of His glory, you feel safe. You feel secure. You don't have worry and fear and anxieties. And for them to have the destruction of the temple, two times the temple's completely destroyed. This was losing for them the very connection they had to their God. And yet in the midst of that, God says, comfort ye, comfort ye. And our sages, our rabbis say, we think God put two comforts in there. One for the first temple and the second one for the second temple. And when he says to comfort, using that word nachum, we have to understand the Hebrew to get the fullness of what this word means. And in this word, the idea of it is, uh, the, the, the best ways let me just describe. If you've been in the midst of something that, that's been terrifying, that's been causing anxiety, that's been giving you a lot of, of grief and a lot of uh, fear, just full of fear, and someone comes into that picture and someone helps bring you through to that place of victory, when you get to that breakthrough, my brother used to say, it's like coming through the knot hole. It hurts going through the knot hole, but oh, it feels so good on the other side. And what do we as a human being collectively do? Doesn't matter what your nationality, this crosses all barriers. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. We all have a similar reaction. When we've come through something hard like that, we realize the relief. We all... <sighs> sigh, a sigh of relief. That's language spoken across the globe. You can be with someone and not be able to communicate in their language and yet they understand the sigh and you understand theirs. That's what Nachum is. That comfort, that's that sigh, that relief, that breathing deeply so that the, the sorrow is now filled with compassion. There is comfort there. And what gives us that kind of comfort? What is God saying when he's saying comfort? How are, is he telling us to comfort ourselves? And the answer is right in his very word. It's the word of God that brings comfort. It's the word of God that directs in the storm. It's the word of God that meets the need no matter what the need is. I will tell you whatever your problem is, the answer is in the Word of God. That's where we need to be because the Word of God is God breathed. It is the God of all comfort. Remember Nachum, El Nachum, the God of comfort. He breathes that comfort. He breathes it to us, into us, in His Word. That Word is infallible, inerrant. There is no other book you can pick up with instruction that you can be guaranteed that it will be perfect and perfectly fitting and every time without fail. There is nothing else. I don't care what book you bring, what language you bring, how, how intelligent the writer was, far beyond the, my little intelligence, but I will tell you, it's flawed. It can't be counted on and it can't permeate to everyone. But remember, God speaking to every individual. He didn't say, I'm only going to comfort over here, or this one, or that leader, or this great person, or the one who gets it because they're smart. No. He says, my comfort is to any. Remember, all who are thirsty, come. Come and buy from me freely. You don't have to exchange anything. I give it freely to you. The Word of God is profitable for instruction, for correction. It is permeating right through where it can splice the most. It, it says between, um, what does it say, between bone and marrow. Ask our doctor here <laughs> how to extract marrow. And it's with a fine needle and it's a precise way to draw. I can't even begin to describe it. I'm not even going to try. But the Word of God can cut through anything. And it cuts it perfectly. It is alive. 
It is powerful. You are not reading dead man's words. The people who we say wrote are gone. They are dead. Their spirit lives forever, but they are not here. They did pass away. But you know, we're really not saying it right when we say Isaiah wrote, because really it's God wrote through the instrument of Yeshia. But it's alive, it is powerful, it's equipping for our life, it is guiding, it is directing, it is answering, it is meeting every need. The Word of God never fails. Never fails. This is what we need to know in time of need. That's why if you're not in the Word, if you're not feeding yourself daily, you're going to starve. And a starving person is going to be weak in that storm. But one who has been eating well will have a well to draw from mm -hmm. and will be able to find that help in the Word of God in time of need. And so God is pointing them to His words. He is a comforter. He is going to be the one that comforts them. No matter whether it's referring to the temple or something personal, God is where the tension needs to go. And our next words in chapter 40 tells us that because it says, as soon as we're past comfort ye, comfort ye, it says, says your God. Hallelujah. It didn't say says Isaiah. It didn't say earlier says Moshe. Because if it did, I'd say to you, if you try to give me that encouragement today, I'd say, but Isaiah's not even here. He's not even alive. And I know Moshe was even buried by God. He's not with us. But God says, I'm the one saying it. And then notice something particular in there because every word, every word matters in the word of God. He didn't say, comfort ye, comfort ye, says the God. Or says a God because there's no other comfort outside of him. We know that. But what does it say? Your God. Your God. Who is that being? Yes, Nora, do you get to say he's your God? Yes. Amen. Tony, get to say he's your God? My God. My God. That's what he's saying. He's personalizing it up front. Your God. And there's the whole key. Go out that door and forget every word Rochelle says, and you're fine. But go out that door and forget any word that God says and you'll suffer the consequences. It is a word of your God. Why do I tell you to get into the Bible? Because if you want to know what your God says, that's where it is. It's nowhere else. You're not going to get it in that book of science. You're not going to get it in that book of mathematics. You're not going to get it in the formula that you have to do for your earthly work. But when you get into the living Word of God. It's there. Do you realize I have just picked up a treasure? Mm. This is more than gold. This is invaluable. If I could only take one thing with me, I'm having to leave. I'm leaving all behind. I can take one thing. This is what I want to take. Mm. And more importantly, Hide his word in your heart because there may be a time when I can't pick that up and take it with me. But what's been put into my heart, the Ruch HaKodesh brings back to my mind. And I find myself in that circumstance, that trouble, that anxiety, that, oh, what am I going to do? And fear wants to grip my soul. And I hear, comfort you, comfort you, says, my God. And then he gives from his word what we need. Don't cheat yourself. He whose Bible falls apart doesn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you get that? Yeah. If your Bible's falling apart, you're not likely to. If your Bible's in good, pristine shape and looks brand new, I'm going to worry about you. <laughs> <laughs> He's speaking comfort. Let's keep reading. He says, speak kindly to Yerushalayim. Or you may have the word tenderly. From the Hebrew, that's the idea. Speak to the heart. If you're speaking to someone's heart, you're speaking in love. 
You're speaking with gentleness. You're speaking with comfort. I can see a, a mama comforting a child. I can see a husband loving a wife. We can look at it in many different pictures. But when we see our God, this is what blows me away. Our ineffable, indescribable, universe-creating, keeping in order God at any moment doesn't say, hold on, let me take care of this. You don't make a phone call and get put on hold. He says, I'm right there. Run into my throne room. Come and receive grace and mercy. And he's ready to comfort you with his very words. That's what I want you to go away with today. Because I know we're all going to go out that door and we are going to have trouble. Common to life. Common to every human being. I've never met one human being yet that could say at any point in their life, I've never had a trouble. I've never had a moment of, of worry. I've never had, as Pastor Allen would say, a kerfunkle. <laughs> but there's one common, one steady, one sure. Remember, it's everlasting. Remember, it's truth. There's no error in it. It is the Word of God. What? A gift we have been given and as he speaks tenderly to the heart he says cry out to her call out to her whichever your your version is Jerusalem you are so upside down right now they know they're being carried off into exile they see what's happening they know they're about to lose I've never been in a situation like that where physically I know that myself, my household, my loved ones, my neighbors, that we're literally going to be carried off, carried away from our home, our security, our freedom, and we are going to become indentured slaves to someone who doesn't have a heart of love. They saw it coming. They're seeing Jerusalem, their precious Jerusalem, being lost. They're losing their temple, their place to come and to worship their God. And in the midst of that, they are being spoken to in these words of comfort. Speak to her. And I love verses 2 and 3 are what's called proleptic. If you don't know what that means, that is looking to the future as if it's already happened. It is so sure, it is so much a fact that it could be claimed already as if done. That's the way God even looks at us in our salvation when we've come through Yeshua Jesus. We're still in our sin-soaked bodies on this sin-soaked earth, but God sees us done in the robe of righteousness, the shed blood of Yeshua that allows us into his presence when we leave this earth. He turns to Jerusalem and he tells her three ways that she's going to be comforted in these two verses. There, well, let me read them to you, and then I'll bring out the three. Cry out to her, call out to her, that her warfare has ended, her guilt has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, if you read that on face value, you're going to say, wait a minute, receive double for her sins? That kind of sounds like you get punished, and you get punished again. That's not what's being said. We've got to go into our Hebrew. And we've got to know what our background is and what's being said. But let me take it in order. The first that, and there's three that's. The first that, be comforted that your warfare has ended. Remember, they're going off. They're losing in war. And he's telling them, the war is over. And you're alive. And you're on the side of victory. But they're, all they can see around them is war. But God is saying, I call it as it is. It's over. And the second is that. And that, that is her guilt has been removed. Or you may have her iniquity is pardoned. She's being told, you're forgiven. Your sin has been removed. How can that be? Because God made a plan for the future. He gave them the sacrificial system to show it. But he didn't say for a moment, those lambs, those bulls, and those goats have been washing away your sin. He said they've been covering your sin. But there's a day coming when that blood of the eternal God of Israel in the human form of Yeshua will wash away those sins. And it is such a sure thing 
It is such a no-so that I'm looking on the other side. Done. Remember the parade? You're looking at the parade, you're sitting curbside, and you see the parade start, you see the middle of it, and you see the end of it. And as you've done that, time has passed. It may take two hours to go from that beginning to end, but God's not sitting on the curb, folks. He's looking down, and he sees the beginning, and he sees the end. He sees the middle, he sees it all, and he says, done. I declare it done. And that's what he's telling the people. Even though you're physically going off into captivity, I declare that your warfare is ended and your iniquity has been washed away. Mm -hmm. Remember, it was their iniquity that's sending them off into captivity. But they're being told that they are being forgiven, pardoned. Do you know what happens when the president gives someone a pardon? They can't be tried for it again. It's done. They've paid that price, and in this case, Yeshua is the one who paid the price. And the third that that we have in this verse, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins, that is an idiom. It's a, a Hebrew way of phrasing it that tells us, it, and I can only say maybe put it into the metaphorical, but what it's saying is your sins have been so taken care of and so washed away that it's like it's been done, double duty. Done and done again. That's what he's saying. You don't have to think that there's one little area that, oops, this didn't get covered. Uh-oh, that wasn't protected. Oh, that wasn't included. No, it is all done. It is so done, it's double done. It's taken away and it's thrown away. It's thrown into the deepest sea and then God puts up that sign that says no fishing. It's gone. And don't let Satan bring up your past. When he does, and he wants to make you fish in those seas that you have no business doing because God's washed them away. You remind him of his future and he'll take off, I'm telling you. <laughs> this was such comfort to our people, Israel. Three areas of comfort that they needed. The physical, the personal, and then to see it, that it would never come back up. It wouldn't be double indemnity. It wouldn't be a charge brought against them again. The, even though they're going to be exiles, they had to be thinking at that time, do we lose all the promises to Avraham? What about what God said to David? What about the fact there's supposed to be one sitting on his throne forever? Because these words came prior. The prophets had spoken these words. Were they feeling, are we abandoned? It, have we lost it all? Has God cut us off? And these words of comfort are the biggest no. Mm -hmm. Put it in capital letters. See it huge. No. The promises are not being forsaken. The word of God is not going to be unfulfilled. What God promised to Abraham, blessing the nation and the nation blessing the world. What God promised David, uh, one will sit on your throne. How long? For ever forever that's what's being told here this is as good as done would that not speak comfort to one who is in the midst of a storm of the storm of going into captivity of being taken from your home that is exactly what was speaking to them when we go on, and I don't have time, I'll go a tiny bit more, but we don't have time to go through it all. The rest of the chapter, we're going to start, verses 3 through 8 are going to tell us that there is a way that has to be prepared. There's a road that has to be made. And it's going to tell us how that road is made. And what we're going to see in the middle of that, in verse 5, is it says, Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Remember what they're losing with that temple? They're losing seeing the glory of the Lord. It's going away. They're feeling the grief and the loss because they moved away from their God. And he is allowing them to realize the consequence when you're not in that right relationship. But here he's saying, it's not over. The enemy didn't win. The fire wasn't put out. The fire that's the glory of the Lord. He's saying it will be vindicated. When this road has been made, and he'll tell them how, his glory will be 
vindicated. Let me give you a little hint in there also that there is one who is going to help them know because it even says in verse 3, the voice of one calling out, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Not doing it in the palace, clear the way where it needs to be cleared. It's like rolling out the red carpet because the, the majesty is coming. And you know this was Near Eastern culture? If a monarch was going to come, there were those who went ahead and literally cleared out the road and the way so that the monarch could come without any bumps or issues or stops on the way. This one we know because we have the, the beautiful benefit of being thousands of years later from Yeshayahu. We know Yochanan the Immerser. He came, John the Baptist, crying out that he was preparing the way in the wilderness. He told about one greater than him who was coming. The one that he said, I'm not even worthy to take the sandal off of his foot. I've got to diminish that he might increase. This is the voice that's being told here. And here is my God showing us once again, hundreds, thousands of years before, and God speaks it as if it's done. And then we see in history, to us now, future for them then, done, done. That's why Yochanan said, when he saw Yeshua coming, behold, Hello, wake up, don't miss it. Behold, here it is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They should have remembered Yeshua's words. They should have said there's a connection here. The same way I showed you the living water that's free in Isaiah and is spoken of again in Revelation, we've got one complete story. And I don't say story as in fairy tale. We have the living in F of, uh, I mean, say, an errant word of God. It's done. It's done. And as I wind up today, whatever your issue is, God has prepared a way. Mm -hmm. God has that way to direct you. He has the answer, and He's bringing you through. He's not dropping you in the middle. He's not leaving you in a storm-tossed sea. Bless our Talmudim, they're on the boat. The sea has gone into a storm. Yeshua is on board. He's sleeping <laughs> in his human flesh. He's sleeping. He wasn't worried. Do you sleep in the midst of your danger of life? No. You're awake and, and screaming and crying out and doing everything you can. And I see again the Talmudim bailing as fast as they can and realizing they're in such trouble and go wake up the master you know we need help here we need to turn to our master and he chides them for their little faith right after it you know it's it's the matter the one who made those waves the one who spoke into existence the one who told the waves where to stop on the sand the one who made the majestic mountains and says, I can flatten them and I can spring them up. This one was on board. This one took one look at the waves that the Talmudim were sure this is the end of our lives. And these aren't little eight-year-old kids. These are adult men who are sure it's over. And the Lord looks and he says to the waves, Shalom, be still. And they cease. And even the Talmudim, who are really trying to grasp fully who this is. Wow. wow. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Is there a wind blowing in your life? Are the waves chopping? Is your boat ready to turn upside down? Well, I know the God of your rocking boat. <laughs> and I know the one who can calm the sea. And it's not what Rochelle says. And I can't answer your need. And I can't fix it for you. But I can point you to the one who can. The one who did. The one who always does. And I can tell you as we come back to this chapter, we are going to see how little man is. How anything we try. You know what the world says? Oh, here, let me give you a pill. You'll feel better for a few hours. Really? You want a pill or do you want God? Why do we look anywhere but 
Gods will. God, okay, God spill. <laughs> okay, we're we're doing a play on words there. That's the only pill I'll take. I'll swallow that one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but we're going to go through it. We're going to see it. We're going to see all the way through this chapter. God just shows and He answers everything of man, and we're left with nothing but God. And it's God who takes us and we soar like the eagles, and we will soar with the eagles at the end of this chapter. So. As we close in prayer, whatever is on your heart, and if you're not in the midst of a trial right now, if the wind isn't blowing, if it isn't fierce, and you're feeling like your, your boat's going to go upside down, just praise Him and thank Him. But realize, for the believer's life, you're either going into a storm, in the storm, or coming out of the storm. So if my words don't mean much today, God's Word will come back as soon as you do. And if you're there today, be encouraged. Be comforted. Nahum. Take that sigh of relief. It's done. It's done. I hear Yeshua on the cross. It is finished. Completed. Finished. Nothing left but for us to praise Him, thank Him, keep our eyes on Him. Remember Yeshua's words. You will keep him in perfect peace, in shalom, shalom, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Put your mind on your God. Trust in him. The Shekhinah glory will come, and your storm will be gone. Your rainbow will be seen, and that's the, the canopy of God's love wrapping you up. And I guarantee you, you'll be able to <sighs> thank you God thank you God oh we praise you our God of all comfort the ever living everlasting God and how we thank you you have so blessed us with this personal relationship through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus and you have blessed us with your word Lord, let us open our treasure. Let us get in. Let us dig out the nuggets that you have for us. Let us do it daily. Let us realize that as much as in our human flesh we need to eat, we need to eat your word. Lord, let us eat it. Let it be in our hearts and our minds that you can bring it back in that moment of need. And for any in that place at this very moment, Lord, may they hear, comfort ye, comfort ye. Thus says their Lord my Lord, our God, the living God of Israel. Lord, how we cry out for our Jewish brethren on this Shabbat to hear these words and to know the God of all comfort in that personal way that you've privileged us to know. Lord, let us be examples. Let them see no fear and no anxiety in us because that's a lack of trust in you. But let us keep our minds as we fill it with the word of God focused on you that we can exude that trust that is never let down, that you never abandon, and you never forsake. We thank you and we praise you, the comfort, the comforter of our lives, in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. And I think even that word too, the Ruch HaKodesh he gives to us when we ask him into our lives, is called the comforter. Yes. Isn't that beautiful? I give you my God. Mm. Hallelujah.
What's in your heart? Yeah. 